Okay, welcome everybody. Um, thank you for joining. Thursday morning, learning the portion of the week, portion of Kitavo, when you will come to the land. As is our custom, we'll begin with the reading of the Parsha in a nutshell, the summary that we have um, sent out in the email. You can follow along, otherwise you can just listen, or you can find it on Chabad.org. In any case, here it goes. Kitavo in a nutshell, Moses instructs the people of Israel when you enter the land that God is giving you to you as your eternal heritage and you settle it and cultivate it, bring the first ripened fruits called Bikurim of your orchard to the Holy Temple and declare your gratitude for all that God has, has done for you. So that's the mitzvah the, of Bikurim, the first fruits. Uh, the word Bikurim comes from the word Bechor. Bechor is firstborn. So there's a firstborn person, and then there's firstborn fruit. Our parsha also includes the laws of the tithes given to the Levites and to the poor, and detailed instructions on how to proclaim the blessings and, and, and the curses on Mount Grizim and Mount Eval, as discussed in the beginning of the, of the parsha of Re'eh. Moses reminds the people that they are God's chosen people and, they, and that they in turn have chosen God. <clears throat> So there's really two themes in the second paragraph. Number one is the conclusion. It gives us some laws about the tithings. And then it discusses how they set up the ceremony that we discussed uh, uh, two weeks ago about the covenant at Mount Grisim and Mount Ava once they enter the land of Israel, as we discussed, and maybe we'll discuss it again. In any case, the final, uh, the second, third paragraph, the latter part of Kitzavo consists of the Tochacha rebuke, after listing the blessings with which God will reward the people when they follow the laws of the Torah, Moses gives, gives a long, harsh account of the bad things, illness, famine, poverty, and exile that shall befall before them if they, if they abandon God's commandments. Moses concludes by telling the people that only today, 40 years after their birth as a people, have they attained their heart to know, eyes to see, and ears to hear. That's the conclusion of the Parsha. So the Parsha, in fact, begins on a very uplifting note. You talk about the Bikurim, the thanking God for bringing us to Israel and fulfilling his promise to our ancestors. So that's very uplifting. But then the Parsha concludes, um, it's very uh, harsh and severe with the, with the rebuke. The Talmud talks about the fact that what we try to do is we try, we, we, the way we set up the calendar, we ensure that we read the portion of Kitavo, the port, this portion, the portion of the rebuke, we ensure to read it before Rosh Hashanah. And why do you want to read it before Rosh Hashanah? Because the Talmud says, Tichlesh Shana V'kileloteha. Let the past year and its past curses be concluded. And Tachel Shana U'birchoteha, let the new year begin with its blessings. In other words, if anything negative it was destined to happen. We want the new year. We don't want it to be in the new year. We want the new year to be a re renewal and blessings. And that's why we sort of get this out of the way and we put it at the end of the previous year. So we can talk about their rebuke. There's a lot to say, certainly from the Hasidic and Kabbalistic perspective, but we have to start, of course, with the uplifting part, the, uh, the mitzvah of Bikurim, the mitzvah of the first, the first, um, <clears throat> the first fruit. Now, if you were a farmer in Israel, you would have to give a nice amount of produce, a nice amount of, 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 of your labor to the temple or to God or to others. And maybe it's not as high as the tax burden and tax bracket in the United States, but it still was close to 20%. Of those gifts, probably the smallest gift is the gift of Bikurim, the gift of the first fruits, because the gift of the first fruit is not a lot of it's not a lot of merchandise. You go into your field and you collect the few fruit that ripen first. And the Mishnah has this whole discussion that 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 even before it ripens, as soon as the fr fruit uh, sprouts or whatever the word is, you would take a little piece of gemi, a little piece of material, and tie it around this fruit to remember that this was the first one that appeared. And then when it ripens a little further, you collect those fruits and you take it to the temple and you give it to the priest and, and uh, wonderful, and you celebrate. But you're not giving a lot of fruit. Maybe you're giving a basket full of fruit. And contrast that to the, to the tremendous amount, 10 or 20% of your produce that you give otherwise, that you give to God, the other gifts. 
And yet this small gift of Bikurim gets all the attention. The gift of Bikurim is the only gift where you have to actually make a whole declaration. You actually have to walk into the temple and you have to make a declaration and you have to tell, tell the history up to that point. As we will discuss, the Torah makes a big deal about this mitzvah of Bikurim, the first fruit, even though it's just a few, for, for a few fruit. Um, the Mishnah describes at great length how there was a whole ceremony when people would bring their first fruit to the temple. They wasn't just the first fruit. They had a whole cer- cer- ceremony. They would make caravans. They would, they would like today they have floats. But in those days, they had the, the ox going before the, the, the ceremony and they would cover the ox in gold and all kinds of descriptions of how people would get together and, and, and for this pilgrimage to bring the first fruit. And in short, it was a big, I, it was a big ceremony, a big deal about a few vegetables or a few, few fruits. And the question is, what's the big deal? You're giving a few fruit to the priest, big deal. I mean, like I said, we're much more generous than that. A Jew would have to give many more, much more of his produce and of his effort, as we will discuss in this, sec- uh, in this parsha. So there's so many interpretations that explain the significance of the Bikurim and what it represents. But the first, inter- the first thing is, is the idea that it's hardest to give it, the, the significance of the Bikurim is not how much you're giving, it's that you're giving it first. It's the first fruit. And it's very hard to give away the first. Um, <clears throat> so people would rather keep what they need. And then if there's any extra, you give it to God, right? You first make sure you have enough money for yourself, then for the savings account, then for the retirement account, then for the vacation account, and then for the miscellaneous account. And then when you're done, you also have an account. If there's anything extra, you give to God. So what, what God wants is the opposite is true. You have to show that you recognize that the blessing comes from God. And therefore, God doesn't need a lot. It's just a first, a few fruits. But the fact that you give it to God first, that shows that you understand and you recognize and you're grateful that the gift comes from God. And today, we don't do this mitzvah in a simple sense. We don't take the first fruit to Jerusalem because you don't have the temple. But... The commentaries explain that a similar concept is supposed to happen with our day because the way we spend our day is really a reflection of our values. So some people, they run, they do everything they need to do, and if they have extra time, they'll give give it to God. Uh, Well, God is saying that the beginning of the day, the beginning of the day is the most precious because what you do in the beginning, that represents what what, what your values are. So God doesn't need a lot of time of the day, but he wants to be first online. He wants to be first online. And therefore, we say the Shema in the morning, we say Moda'ani, or we pray, whatever it is. It's not about the time, but it's about the fact that in the morning, in the beginning of our day, not after we finished all our errands and we have some extra time, but the placing um, the, the, the prayer and thanksgiving to God as the first thing, that is how we play out the concept of Bikurim in our, in our life. So that's the first moments of the day, Moda'ani or Shema, or however you do it, but it's showing the priority that thanksgiving to God is an important aspect of your day because it's very hard for people to do because, again, like going back to the produce, I don't mind to give some away, but I feel that I put in all this effort and I put in all this labor and I waited six months for the produce to grow and you did put in all that labor, but of course God is an integral part of the blessing and giving it to him first um, represents that concept. Um, Before I got married, I got marriage advice from from an older rabbi. I'm still trying to figure out if it's good marriage advice or not. I don't know. So you have to ask my wife. But in any case, I'll put it out there. And then I don't even know why I'm saying it. It's not exactly uh, connected, but why not? Entertainment. So the fellow told me like this. He said that in your life, you have your own needs. And then you have your wife's needs. And then you have... You know, you're religious Jews, so you have God's needs. God makes certain demands on your time. God wants you to pray. God wants you to keep Shabbat. God wants you to go to Shalom Yom Kippur, whatever it is. There's also, God also has needs. So the guy told me like this. He says, look, your wife doesn't mind being second. Doesn't mind being second. But she doesn't want to be third. So in other words, if you feel like you have to put God first, then you put God first, then you put your wife second, and you're a third. If you feel like you're first, okay, fine. But you can't tell your wife, that, okay, first I have to take care of myself. Then I have to go to shul and pray because I'm a spiritual person and you're last. He said it doesn't go, it doesn't work that way. She doesn't want to be second, but she's not gonna to wanna to be third. So that's good advice. In any case, I don't know if it's good advice. That's just what I'm repeating. The point of the story is 
that the question of who goes first is a very important question, and that's the message of the mitzvah of the Bikurim, that God doesn't need a lot of your time, but it, he wants it in the morning, because the morning represents what's the priority. What do you do the first thing? That shows the priority. Okay, fine. That's the first, that's one idea. Another idea is that <clears throat> we make a big deal about this fruit. And if we're reading the Torah and we're sensitive to what we read in the past, the fruit take up, an, the, the, fruit, the fruit remind us of another episode, a very tragic episode. And that is that when the spies came back from scouting the land of Israel and coming back to the people, and they told the people that it's a terrible idea to go to Israel because even though Israel is a, a fertile land and it's got beautiful fruit, but it's a land we're not going to be able to be successful. And they say a few things. One of the things they say is that it's a land that consumes its inhabitants. Eretz ochelet yoshveha, a land that consumes its inhabitants, which could mean many things. But if you've been here before, you know the Hasidic interpretation is that the spies told the people, yes, it, Israel is a great place to grow um, agriculture, to grow produce. You'll be very successful. In fact, they bring back the produce to show how beautiful the produce is. But the problem is, they say, that the act of growing produce, the act of agriculture, is all consuming. It takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of effort and it's actually going to pull you in completely and you're not going to have time for your spiritual pursuits. So when they say, when the spies say, Eretz Ochelet Yoshveha, this land is a land that consumes its inhabitants, what they're telling the Jews is not that it's not a beautiful land, it is a beautiful land. Not that um, you cannot produce beautiful fruit, you could produce beautiful fruit. And in fact, they bring back the fruit as evidence to show how beautiful the fruit is. Why? Not to say that it's so great, and therefore let's go conquer the land, but let's run for the hills because Yes, you can create beautiful fruit, but it takes a tremendous amount of effort and it's going to pull in all your resources, all your focus and all your attention, and eventually you'll have nothing left for spirituality and the land, the materialism is going to pull you in. That's the, that's the story that the spies tell the Jewish people and successfully persuade the Jews that going into Israel is a bad idea, which leads to terrible consequences of the Jews staying in the desert for another 40 years. Okay. Says, say that, say, this is an interpretation that I saw from the Rebbe, says the Rebbe that bringing the fruit of the Bikurim, the first fruit, it's not, why do we make a big ceremony about this? It's not that how many fruit you get, the priest can go home and eat the fruit. It's just a basket full of fruit. It's not really going to, the purpose is not to feed the poor or feed the hungry. That you do with other tithings. The Bikurim, the first fruit, I'm not going to celebrate that. What the, what the Bikurim, the first fruit do is they celebrate the triumph over the claim of the spies. Remember, the claim of the spies is that if you're going to grow beautiful fruit, it's going to distract you from holiness. It's going to distract you from a relationship with God. And the bringing of the first fruit and how the first fruit bring, um, um, cultivate within the person a sense of joy and thanksgiving and connection to God. And that's why we bring the fruit to God because we represent that, the, that, that, that God has blessed the fruit and we're thankful for the fruit and the fruit intensify, the, 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 the material success intensifies that relationship with God. That is the triumph of, of the Jewish story, of the Jewish philosophy, of the Jewish way of life over the claim of the spies. Because the claim of the spies say that if you engage in materialism to the point of getting inv invested in agriculture, it's going to pull you away from spirituality and the materialism is going to swallow you up. And, but Judaism claims the opposite. Judaism is not like the religions that say if you want to be close to God, you have to escape and transcend and separate from the material. To the contrary, the purpose of Judaism is to sanctify the material. And that's very radical. And that's why the spies couldn't accept it. So when we bring our first fruit to Jerusalem, we are now, this is a, a, this is a vindication of the Jewish mission statement. This is, the, this is the vindication of the Jewish way of life. We persevere. The materialism is not a distraction. The materialism, the success, the success of materialism actually brings us closer to God. So this is a big deal because it's not about the fruit. It's about what the fruit represents. It's about the fact that the agriculture, the labor, the investment in the material world does not pull us away from God, 
as the spy said, it doesn't make, it doesn't swallow us up. In fact, we elevate it. We put it into the temple. We put it into a basket. We bring it to the temple. We elevate the fruit as opposed to the fruit bringing us down. So why are we making a big deal about the fruit? Because it represents our mission statement as opposed to the claim of the spies. So that's just the two short points about the Bikurim. First of all, you want to make sure that it's so important to give God something early in the morning. And that's why we make the great celebration because the hardest thing to do is to put God first. Um, he doesn't want a lot, but he wants to be first. Um, this, and the second point is the, the Bikurim really represent everything we're doing. We're growing fruit, whatever you're investing in, you're growing fruit, you're growing material success. And the purpose is to put that in a basket and raise it to Jerusalem. In other words, show how the fruit themselves can be sanctified, can be brought to, te to the temple, could intensify your relationship with God and not, God forbid, the way the spies said, that, the, that the, those fruit are going to pull you down. So that's two points. Of course, there's a lot more to say, which we're going to say, but that's for the beginning. If anybody wants to make any comments, jokes, marriage advice, whatever you like, now is a good time. Rabbi, isn't the yes. way you just described this message of the spies uh, or the contrary message that that we should go towards materialism, just the opposite of the message that we learned in Egypt in the Exodus, which is to go away from materialism? We, we believe in sanctifying the materialism. In other words, elevating it, raising it to the temple. In other words, in other words the conventional interpretation is that materialism could remove, could make, would make you more focused on self, would make would orient you towards self and toward narcissism, and ultimately, if you have enough materialism, it will bring you down. And that's in fact what Moshe says. It's a big theme in the fifth book. Moshe in the fifth book in Deuteronomy is very is afraid that the success and the and the prosperity will lead people to think that my power makes me successful and move us away from God. And that's the, one occur that's the one reoccurring theme in the entire book, the danger of success. And Moshe tries to tell us that not let the success get to our mind and realize that, the that it's God who gives us the power to be successful. So this is a big theme in Moshe's, in Moshe, in Moshe's, in Moshe's, uh, um, Moshe's projecting to the future. When he's thinking about the future, he's very concerned that the material success should not get to the minds of the people and get, make them arrogant and move them away from God. And that's what he's, that's basically the one theme, the one reoccurring theme of the whole book. Now, maybe that's why the mitzvah of Bikurim is placed at the end, uh, sort of toward the end, the culmination of the book of Deuteronomy. It's one of the last mitzvot. By some accounts, it's the last, it's not the last, one of the last mitzvot of the book, because Moshe is saying either you're going to, the wealth will either move you away from God as he described, as the prof, as the spies predicted, and as Moshe himself predicts, that is, a, that is a real danger. And in reality, Moshe was right that sometimes the success actually moved us away from God. But that's not the way it should be. The way it should be, and the antithesis, and the way to protect yourself against this material success leading to arrogance and then leading you away from God is to realize, is to do the mitzvah of Bikurim, to practice the mitzvah of Bikurim either literally in the times of the temple or figuratively in our days. In other words, if you're taking the first fruit and giving it to God, it's because you realize that the most important partner in this endeavor is God. And therefore you give it to him. And when you give it to him first, you pay him well first, that shows the gratitude and that shows the humility that you couldn't do this alone because I'm a great guy, but I need God to bless the land. I need God to make the rain to come down. So the Bikurim protects us against the danger of success. And what's the, what's the, what, what is, how does it protect us? Because it allows us to focus on the gratitude to God and the recognition that it's not our own power, it's not our own might, but it's the blessing of God. And if it's the blessing of God, then it could be sanctified and elevated and brought to the temple and actually intensify our own relationship with God. So there's a lot at stake here. Success is a big problem. Success, success, success is, the Talmud says there's the, there's the there's the test of, of poverty and there's a test of success. And Egypt was the test of poverty. But coming into the land of Israel, Moshe's concern will be a greater test, a great, the test of success. And he's afraid that the success will make us arrogant and move us away from Hashem. What's the antidote to that? The antidote is, of course, the mitzvah of Bikurim. God, you, 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 you say the first fruit belongs to God because that shows the gratitude. 
And that shows the dependence we have on God. And then that is the protection against the negative, the negative, uh, po the possible negative consequence of material success, which could be arrogance and making us forget God. Does that make any, I hope that that clarifies a little bit. Okay, fine. Thank you. Okay, we still have a lot to talk about, even the Bikurim. So let's read, let's, we, we, always, we like to read the beginning of the Parsha. So if you want to look inside, it's chapter 26 of the book of Deuteronomy. And it's verse, it's, if you have the art scroll, Chumash, it's 1069. Okay, what happens when we bring the Bikurim? We make a speech. And, you know, you always, you, you ask somebody, and someone moves to Greenwich. Today, everybody's moving to Greenwich. Um, you ask someone, okay, where are you from? So different people respond differently, right? Because they've been around for 60, 70 years. Maybe they covered, maybe they lived in five places or 10 places. So some people start from, where are you from? You know, where's the last place you moved from? Some people start from where they were born, right? So, so I say, tell me about yourself. Well, my great grandmother came to the United States. Okay, where are you starting your story? It's a very important question. Where, like, tell me your story. Where does my story start? So what's interesting, when I bring the fruit to God, I'm gonna thank God. So what should I say? God, thank you, I planted the produce and, the, and, and believe it or not, it grew. Or uh, if it's an orchard, if it's fruit, I, um, I pruned the trees and it rained and guess what happened? Now we have new um, avocados. So now we have new apples, it's wonderful. That's the story, but that's not where we start. We start hundreds of years earlier, at least, if not more than a thousand years earlier. We say, oh, our great grandfather Jacob had some tribulations. He went to Lavan, they went to Egypt and came up and they bring us to this land. We give a whole speech, we give a whole history lesson um, just because you want to give a few, a, a few fruit, fruit, it's called not, it, when you bring the, the Bikurim, there's a mitzvah of Hava'at Bikurim, to bring the Bikurim, and then there's the mitzvah of Mikra, to read, to read the declaration. And the declaration is strange because it goes back, it sort of gives us the whole picture of Jewish history, which we don't do when we give other tithings. We don't do when we come to the pilgrimage in the temple and bring other offerings, specifically the first fruits, which is strange. By the way, we, when we want to tell, now, when the Jew comes to God and the Jew tells the God the declaration of thanksgiving and thanks God and tells us the history, one of the things the Jew does is tells us the history, as he recounts the history of Egypt. He says what happened in Egypt in a concise form. And we actually plagiarize and we take this speech for our Passover Seder, which is very strange. So you'll read some of these verses may sound familiar from the Passover Seder, which is very strange. Why is it so strange? Because the primary place where the Torah tells us what happened in the book of Exodus, uh, uh, in the Exodus of Egypt, is the book of Exodus. You guessed right. The story of Exodus is in the book of Exodus, the second book of the Torah. In the fifth book, the Torah here gives us a recount, a recap of the story, but it's not, it's not, it's not at great length. It's not where the story actually happened. It's when the Jew is retelling what happened in the past. And when we want to recount the story, we don't go to the book of Exodus. We go to the book of Deuteronomy. We take this Parsha, we quote these verses, and we elaborate upon these verses. In other words, we take a quote from this week's Parsha, and then we say, oh, you want to know what this quote means? Let's go back to the book of Exodus. <coughs> So in short, what I'm trying to say is, is we use this version to tell the story. And the question is, how come? So there are all kinds of theories. One theory is, is that when we say, when we, the, what's the Passover experience? The Passover experience is, we know that as the Passover Haggadah says, that every person has to see themselves as if they themselves have left Egypt. In other words, when we, see, when we, when we, we tell the story on Passover, we're not saying it as something that happened in the past. We're saying it as something that happened to us. We want to put ourselves in the mood and feel like we're experiencing the story. So quoting the book of Exodus is not going to help for that. Why not? Because the book of Exodus just says what happened. But that doesn't mean I am able to experience what happened if I wasn't there. So we take the precedence from the book, the precedent from the book of Deuteronomy. It says this, when you bring the Bikur, there. 
first person. So if the book tells us to do that, and that's how the Deuteronomy tells us to do that, that's the proof text that we are able to do that. And therefore, we're much more interested in those verses because those verses are more interesting to us because it tells us that even somebody who was not in Egypt could identify with the experience to the extent that he could say it in first person. So that's, that's an interesting concept. Okay, so I'm going to read a few verses, and then we want to understand what's the, what's, what's, why we sing all this. Like, why this, and you, you know, you have the Megillah, the scroll of Esther, so in Yiddish is whenever the person, whenever, whenever the speech is too long, you say it's the whole Megillah, it's the whole Megillah. Why are we making this whole Megillah? Again, all you're doing is bringing a, fr a, few, a few fruit, and here we're just going on and on and telling all of Jewish history. It's ridiculous. We don't do it in other, in other, in other, in other, in other circumstances. We don't do it with all the other gifts that we bring to God. So that's what we, so let me just read the verses and we see from there. So, okay, so it says you come to the land and uh, you'll take the first fruit. You come to the priest and then you make your declaration. I'm skipping to verse five. So chapter 26, verse five, here we go. The journey begins, verse five. Then you shall call out and say before Hashem your God, an Aramean tried to destroy my forefather. My forefather is Jacob. He ran away to Aram, to Lavan and his cousin, his uncle, and then there the, his forefather tried to destroy him. What exactly that means is for another time. Then he descended to Egypt and sojourned there. Years later, Jacob went to Egypt, few in number, and there he became a nation, great, strong, and numerous. The Egyptians mistreated us and afflicted us and placed hard work upon us. Then we cried out to Hashem, the God of our forefathers. And Hashem heard our voice and saw our affliction, our travail, and our oppression. Hashem took us out of Egypt with a strong hand and with an outstretched arm, with great awesomeness and with signs and with wonders. He brought us to this place and he gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So yeah, we just covered hundreds of years of history from Jacob until God bringing us back to the land of Israel. And now behold, I have brought for the, um, the first fruit of the ground that you have given me, O Hashem, and you shall lay it before Hashem your God, and, you'll, and you shall prostrate yourself before Hashem your God. So this is the story of, <clears throat> this is the story of the declaration that we offer when we bring the Bikurim, when we bring the first fruit. Why we, why, why we talk this so much? Why are we saying this whole history? So, one possible interpretation is as follows. The purpose of the first fruit is to show our gratitude. So one way to think about the story is, the perp another theme that reappears in the book of Deuteronomy, and, and, and it, reappears, it appears in the first book of Deuteronomy for the first time, and it appears in multiple places in the book of Deuteronomy, including later in the Parsha, is the theme of joy. You have to rejoice in all the good that God gives you. And the commentaries explain, the Mishnah explains, that the first fruit <clears throat> are also, because the verse mentions joy, the first fruit are also given in the season of joy. And therefore, if you have your first fruit, you have to bring it only between Shavuot, this, the, this, the holiday of the harvest, and, Suk and Sukkot, the holiday of the ingathering. But theoretically, if you found your first fruit and you dried it up, and then you decide to bring it after Sukkot, you can't bring it then. Why not? Because it's not a time of simcha, it's not a time of joy. So part of this whole theme of the book of Deuteronomy is how do we cultivate a sense of joy? Now, let's think about joy for a second, because the paradox of joy is that um, the societies that have the most are not always the happiest. And creating joy <clears throat> is, a, is, is, a, is a big problem because People are not very good predictors of what brings them joy. People think, well, if I get a certain amount of success, if I get a certain resources, I am certainly going to be joyous. If I can buy a 70-foot yacht, I'm going to be joyous. And of course, when you finally get your 70-foot yacht, you're very happy. Two days, and realize that your neighbor has a 120-foot yacht, and then there it goes. Now you need a jet. The question becomes, what indeed is the joy that you can cultivate within yourself and even um, teach your children? Because that's also important. You can give your, your children all kinds of 
all kinds of good things. But if you're not giving them the gift of learning how to achieve joy, then uh, you're not helping them. And, and it's possible that giving them the gifts without giving them the, the ability to appreciate them actually is actually maybe even counterintuitive, but counterproductive, but that's another story. So what are the ingredients of joy? The first thing we know is what, what, what does not lead joy. Possessions don't necessarily lead to joy. Um, so what does lead to joy? So what leads to joy is there are two, there are these two ingredients. Number one, one ingredient is gratitude. In other words, easier said than done. But if I take whatever you give me for granted, if I, if my approach is I'm entitled to whatever you give me, then, then whatever you give me is not going to make me happy because whatever you give me actually frustrates me because you should have given, given, given me more. It's like your children say, I try to tell my child what I do for them. So my, my child says, what do you mean? You're my father. That's your job. Okay. So what are you going to do? Whatever you do for them, it, but I don't care if you put money in their college account, if you take them to the park, whatever you do, that's your job. So they're not going to say thank you. They're not going to feel grateful. They say, what do you mean? That's, that's your job. And um, I confess, that's what I think about my parents too. What do you mean? You gave me something. That's your job. You're my parent. What do you want? So the, to cultivate a feeling of joy, a person must, be, must feel gratitude. Gratitude means I'm not entitled to this. And of course, it's very hard because in the society we live in, we're born, we're raised to think that we are entitled <coughs> to everything. And therefore, whatever we get is a good step in the way to the next step. But that's not, but, but, but we really, we're really deserving. And therefore, um, we, it's very hard for us to experience joy. And therefore, what Judaism does, one of, I'm not saying, one of the things that Judaism does, because we have so many opportunities to be grateful to God, every time we eat something, we say, we say a blessing. So one way to look at it is God has a low self-esteem and therefore God needs the reinforcement. And we have to keep reminding him of, of reminding him of how great he is. Every time I take a bite into a sandwich, I have to thank God for producing the bread. But that's only a superficial interpretation of the blessings. What the blessings are really telling us is of giving us the opportunity for gratitude. And we will not enjoy the sandwich if <coughs> we are not grateful as much as we will if we are grateful. So Judaism, the whole Judaism really is a, is a, is a uh, opportunities to practice gratitude. And in the biblical story, the place that this is most recognized is within the first fruit. It's clear that what God wants to, us to show is his, our gratitude to him. And therefore we make the big ceremony and therefore we take the fruit and we bring it to God and we say, God, you get the fruit first because it's your blessing and we are grateful to your blessing. So if the purpose is to feed the poor, we need a lot more fruit. If the purpose is to cultivate gratitude, a basket full of fruit is enough if you're going to cultivate the gratitude and if you're going to realize that it comes from God. So that's one ingredient. So gratitude is a very good ingredient, but because we're so complicated and um, it's so hard to cultivate gratitude, there's another ingredient to joy that also ties into the story. The other, uh, the other, the other ingredient to joy, and this is, a little bit, this is a little bit more abstract, but it's an important concept. The ingredient to joy is purpose. A person has everything they need, but they're living a life of emptiness. In other words, they don't feel that their existence has meaning. They feel that their existence is a mistake or their existence is just random. There's no way a person will be joyous because you can have some pleasure for a day or two or three, but after a while, there's a deep psychological need for a person to feel that my existence has meaning. So somehow in the story, if we're trying to cultivate joy, we need gratitude, so that's the fruit of bringing, that, that's the idea of bringing the first fruit to God to show that we're grateful. But the story is also here to tell us meaning. We are part of a story, we're part of a mission. And therefore, when we bring this basket of fruit, we stop telling us ourselves the entire story of the Jewish people. There's our ancestors, there's a history. We are the culmination of that history. We are the culmination of the promise to our patriarchs. Why are we the culmination? Because we carry the mission of our patriarchs. So going into Jewish history, telling ourselves, we're not just, I'm not just an individual person, but I'm part of a larger story. That's how I give meaning to my life. That's how I give purpose to my life. Now I understand what my mission is on this earth. If I understand that, then I could be joyous with my fruit because I can have all the fruit in the world. But if I either don't feel grateful or don't feel that it has any purpose, and all the fruit in the world are not going to make me happy.
If I want the joy, I need to bring the first fruit, show the gratitude, and I need to read the story, read the declaration, read the story, see how I am part of a greater whole, I'm part of a greater story, I'm part of a historic mission, and that is, um, and that is the meaning in my life, and that's the second ingredient of joy, the gratitude and the meaning. So if you can give your children the sense of developing a sense of gratitude, and maybe even more important than that, more important, I'm not going to go into what's more, what's less, but also that a sense that their life has meaning, you're giving them the, the, the gift of gratitude. If your child leaves your house and goes to college, and by the time they leave, they don't sense that their existence has any, any, any meaning, then you maybe give them a lot of fruit. But unless they meet Chabad on campus, okay, that's just a plug. And um, unless they figure out how to develop a sense of meaning for themselves, they will not be experience, experience the joy. So that is, the, that is the next thing we talked about, the ingredients of joy embedded into the mitzvah of Bikurim, of the first fruits. <clears throat> okay, we have another couple of minutes. A lot to talk about. If anybody wants to make any comments, wonderful. If you want to have some tea or coffee or schnapps, also it's a good time, whatever you need. Okay, After once we discuss the concept of bringing the first fruit and making the declaration. So on verse 12, we move to a, little, uh, to a different theme because it's also a, a declaration. What's a declaration? That's called vidui ma'asrot. The, 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 um, it's a funny word. The confession of the tidings. Now, I know we think of confession as something negative, but here the confession is something positive. You confess the tidings. What does it mean? So... Every year, there's a certain, a certain amount of tithe, tithe, tithes that a person is supposed to give from his produce. But you don't have to actually deliver it until the end of the third year. At the end of the third year, you have to make sure that the gifts that you were supposed to, de that you designated, are out of your house and in the hands of the recipient. That's at the end of the third year. <coughs> and when you finished, when, when you finished, delivering the tidings at the end of the third year, you make a declaration. You make a confession. What's the confession? Not how terrible I am, but the confession is, I did everything right. I separated the tidings. I was pure. I didn't, I did, I didn't become impure. I gave everything to whoever needs to get it. God, I did what I, what I was supposed to do. Now bless me. So why that's called the confession is another story. We'll get to that later, maybe. But that's called Vidoy Master. So I want to just take a minute or two and talk about the tidings. I talked about this in past years. But it's, I think it's important anyway to repeat, at least briefly. So let's just talk about, the, let's, do it, let's do the technical things here just very quickly. If you don't like technical, zoom out, come back in 60 seconds. So there's a seven-year cycle in the agriculture cycle in Israel. Why a seven-year cycle? Because the seventh year is a sabbatical. So it's seven, seven year, the seventh year, you don't do any work. If you don't do any work, there's no tithings. What about the fruit of the orchard that grow by themselves? It's free for everybody. I have an orchard, I have an orange, uh, orange, uh, orange grove. The seventh year, I can eat the oranges, but anybody else can eat the oranges. They can't chop the trees, but they can eat the fruit. So the, seven years, there's no, the seventh year, there's no tithing. It's a year of rest, there's no work, there's no tithing. So we have six years. The six years consist two, two cycles of three years apiece. And the way the tithings work is as follows. There's what they call ma'aser rishon, the first tithing. What's the first tithing? The first tithing is you take 10% of your produce and you give it to the Levites. Who is the Levite? The Levite is it was a full tribe of Israel. So it's like a 12th of the Jewish people or a 13th, depending on how you count, if you count Joseph and two. Um, so it's a significant percent of the Jewish people that did not receive a portion in the land of Israel. So they had no agricultural land and then it was an agricultural society. So they had no way of sustaining themselves. Their job was to serve in the temple as supporting roles and to teach the Torah to the people. And as payment, and the way they would sustain themselves is that the, that, that the Israelites would give them tithing, 10% of the produce. 10% of the produce to a 13th of the, po of the population is not, not bad, I guess. That's a good ratio. In any case, that is, that's the first tithing. That tithing exists all six years. All six years of the cycle, you bring the first tithing. 
Then you have the second tithing, which we'll leave, for us, leave aside in a moment. You have the tithing for the poor. There were not that many, that many poor people back then because every, when you enter Israel, everybody has a land, a portion in the land. And even if you sell your portion of the land, it will come back to you eventually. So there are some people, but not that many poor people. So therefore, the, the tithing of the poor is just two of the six years, year three and year six. So in year three and year six, in addition to giving the first tithing to the Levite, you're also giving the tithing to the poor in year three and year six. Then we have a very interesting tithing, the most interesting tithing. And the reason why it's the most interesting is because this is, this is, I guess, unique to the Jews. There's no other tithing that we know of that's like this. Again, to give the priests, to give the Levites, that's common. To give the poor is also common. But then there's what they call Maser Sheni, the second tithing. What is the second tithing? The second tithing is that you take 10% of the produce after you give 10% to the, to the priest, to the Levite. You take another 10%. And what do you do with that percent, with that 10%? That 10% you take with you to Jerusalem and you eat it in Jerusalem. You have to literally eat 10% of your produce in Jerusalem. That's a lot of food. Now, if you can't schlep all the food to Jerusalem, the Torah is kind to you. You can convert the produce to money and take the value of the money, take it to Jerusalem, eat in Jerusalem, spend it in Jerusalem, and celebrate in Jerusalem. So it's almost like a vacation fund. You want to make sure that when you go on vacation to Jerusalem, because three times a year you're supposed to go to Jerusalem, and you'll have enough food to eat. There are all kinds of commentaries that explain that's part of the catch. Part of the catch of this mitzvah is to make sure you're going to hang out in Jerusalem. If you have to eat 10% of your produce in Jerusalem, that means you have to stay there for a significant amount of time. Staying in Jerusalem is, a good, is actually a good place for you to be because all year you're a farmer, you're far away from Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the spiritual capital of Israel. There is the temple, there's the high court, there is the learning, the centers of learning. So being in Jerusalem puts the farmer in a spiritual environment. Okay. But what is the second tithing? The second tithing is not I'm giving to somebody else. I am eating my own fruit in Jerusalem, and that is classified as something holy. <coughs> so that's classified as something holy. So I say this is a unique Jewish tithing because typically a tithing is giving to somebody else. Here, the second tithing is giving it to yourself. So we wanna talk about that for a minute. So just to repeat, um, the first tithing you give all six years. The second tithing you give year one, two, four, and five. And the third tithing you give, another, not the third tithing, the tithing of the poor, you give year three and year six. Now you know everything you need to know about tithings. Okay, the problem for us is that we live outside of Israel, so we don't offer these tithings. In, 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 in Israel, they do so symbolically to some degree. They actually do it. But we live out of Israel, so we don't perform any of these tidings. So what's the message to us? Why are we gathering here Thursday morning in the middle of September to figure, in the beginning of September, to figure out how to divide our tidings if we're not really dividing our tidings? So here there's a beautiful commentary that I may have said in the past, but it's nice anyway. Um, when the Torah is telling you how to, what type of tidings to give, it's not just telling you um, who, do, who needs support. It's much deeper than that. What it's telling you, it's, if you need a title, it's telling you how to spend your money. In other words, you have money. What are you going to do with your money? What are you going to spend your money on? So the values that the Torah wants to instill within ourselves, and when the Torah says you as an individual need to give three types of tithing, it's basically saying there are three values that you should spend money on. And that is an indicator, not just for the actual tithing, but what are the most important values in your life? What are you trying to achieve with all your money and with all your wealth? So let's think about this for a second. What are we trying to achieve with our money and our wealth? So the first thing society has to create, the first tithing, what's the first tithing? First tithing is the Levites. But broadly speaking, what it, in, other words, in other words, not literally the Levites, but what do Levites represent? Figuratively speaking, what do Levites represent? The Levites represent the spiritual side of life. They were the farmers. They were the ones who studied Torah. They were the ones who, 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 who uh, served in the temple. So what do the Levites represent? When, I, when the Torah says, give 10% of your produce to the Levite, what the Torah is saying is, take your resources and create a spiritual life for yourself. Have time to go study Torah, 
buy yourself a nice uh, library of Jewish books, buy yourself high-speed internet so you can follow Jewish classes, create a spiritual haven in your life. That is one val that's one thing you should create with your money. Okay, that's the first tithing. What's the second tithing? Here, second tithing is the most interesting. What's the purpose of your money? Not to give it away, to enjoy it, but enjoy it in Jerusalem. What does it mean, enjoy it in Jerusalem? Similar to what we said earlier with the story of the Bikurim, which is maybe why it's one follows the next. Enjoy it in Jerusalem means you enjoy the physical food that you have, but that's a holy experience. You're taking it to Jerusalem. It's classified as holy. It's not allowed to become impure. Because what the Torah teaches the Jew is that you connect to God not only when you're a Levite, well, not only when you're studying Torah, not only when you're service, serving in the temple, but when you engage in physical pleasures, that experience itself, the second tithing, it's, that experience itself is expressed in the second tithing, that can be a holy experience. You can find God not only in the spiritual, but also when you're enjoying your, the physical bounty in a, in, a, in, a, in a wholesome and productive and holy way. So the second tithing is the second thing we're supposed to do with our money. What? Enjoy it, but sanctify it. And sanctify it doesn't mean give it away. Sanctify is use it in a holy manner. That's the second tithing. And finally, the third tithing is that, of course, you have to support others. Because um, the first tithing is really supporting yourself. You're, you're giving it to the Levite because of what the Levite does for you, because you want a spiritual a connection to God. So you want somebody who will dedicate the time to create that spiritual environment that you could benefit from. So first tithing is your spiritual needs. Second tithing is sanctifying your, phys your physical existence. And the third tithing is giving it to other people. In other words, sharing with other people. So one way to look at it is as follows. When we say the Levite is the first tithing and the Jewish person eating their produce in Jerusalem is the second tithing. Which one is greater? In a sense, the greater is not the first. The greater is the second. It's first because the first serves the second. In other words, how do I ensure that when I am eating my fruit, it's a holy experience? It's because I first gave the first tithing. In other words, how do I ensure that when I engage in material pleasures, it's for a holy purpose? It's because first, I dedicate, dedicate a time to spirituality. So in other words, in our life where we don't have the tithings, if you start your day with, mo with praying to God, if you start your day with studying Torah, if you start your day with giving the first fruit to God, that means you're creating a spiritual time in your life. That's, that's like the first tithing. The first tithing is supposed to serve the second tithing. And the second tithing is that your physical existence is sanctified. But your physical existence is not going to be sanctified unless you first dedicate time for spirituality. So the goal is not to dedicate time to spirituality. The goal is the second tithing. The second tithing is that your physical experience is sanctified. But you can't get to the second before you go to the first. And where, how do you, how, where does the tithing of the poor come in? How do you know? What's the test? What's the test that my physical blessings are, are holy? and by engaging in the, in the physical pleasures are holy and wholesome and not just selfish, the test that you're using your materialism properly, the test that you're set up for your second tithing, that, you, that the physical bounty is bringing you closer to God, the test is if you're going to give on the third year, if you're going to give to the poor. Because if you're gonna transcend yourself and say, I'm giving to somebody else, that means that the uh, engaging in the second tithing was not focused on the ego. It wasn't self-driven because now you demonstrate that I'm able to transcend myself and give to somebody else. So in other words, first tithing, dedicate, the first tithing, dedicate time to spirituality is here to serve the second one. The second tithing is the goal. The second tithing is that a person should engage in their own material uh, bounty in a holy way. So that's why it's called first and second because the goal is to get to the second. The tithing of the poor is not a third tithing. It's an expression of the second. It proves, it's the test that the second is indeed holy, that my engagement in my material materialism actually brings me closer to God and not closer to self. The test to that is if I can share with somebody else and transcend my own ego. So that is the second section of this parasha, the second piece, which is what they call the confession of the, of the tithings.
if you want to read it, because we spoke so much time about it, just to get a feel for the verses. So I'm on page 1069. Uh, no, I'm on page 1071, Confession of the Tithes, verse 12 in chapter 26. <coughs> when you have finished tithing every tithe of your produce in the third year, the year of the tithe, you shall give it to the Levite, to the proselyte, to the orphan, and to the widow, and they shall eat it in your gates and be satisfied. Right? Because we're talking about the third year. The third year, who do we feed? We feed the Levites, the first tithing, and we also give to the poor. Poor in the Torah is the convert, because the convert doesn't receive a portion of the land. Orphan and widow are, are, are synonymous with the poor. So that's the third tithing. Tithing one and tithing, th and, and, and tithing of the poor. So when you finish doing that in the third year, says verse 13, then you shall say before Hashem your God, I have removed the holy things from the house. The sages explain what is the holy things? What's, which, which maaser, which tithing is classified as holy? Says Rashi, Zem maaser sheni. The second tithing is the only tithing called holy. It's very interesting. I would think the one I'm giving to the Levites are the most holy. No, holy is the second tithing. The goal is the second tithing. And I also have given it to the Levite. That's the first tithing. To the proselyte and to the orphan and to the widow. That's the tithing of the poor. According to whatever commandment you commanded me, I have not transgressed any of your commandments and I have not forgotten. I have not eaten of it in my intense mourning because you're not allowed, because all the tithings are holy. A person's not allowed to eat it when he's sad, when he's mourning. Um, I did not consume it in a state of contamination. In other words, a person wasn't ritually impure. And I did not give it for the needs of the dead. I have hearkened to the voice of Hashem, my God. I have acted according to everything you commanded me. Right? So not all, tithe, not all confessions are bad. I sinned, I sinned, I sinned. Here is saying, I did this right, I did that right. I gave the first tithing, the second tithing, the tithing of the poor. I did it properly. I wasn't impure. I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't in an intense state of mourning. So I say, I did everything we can do. And then we say a beautiful verse, verse 15. Gaze down from your holy abode, from the heavens, and bless your people, Israel, and the ground that, that you gave us. In other words, bless the people as well as the land, as you swore to our forefathers, a land flowing with milk and honey. So this is um, beautiful, the beautiful um, blessing that we give after we mention we did everything, we did our part, now do your part. So this is a beautiful parasha, at least the beginning. We then move to the blessings and the curses which are a little bit more negative. But again, if you read it in a Hasidic uh, lens, then you have to find the positivity within the negativity, which is another story. But that's uh, beyond the scope of today. Maybe we'll do that tomorrow. We'll see. Uh, 10 o'clock is, is Hasidic, unless we may have other things coming up. I may have to cancel. But in any case, um, I hope this was somewhat uh, enjoyable for you as it was for me. And uh, if anybody has any comments or questions, go ahead. Otherwise, we will... God willing, we convene in the future, either online or in person, in good health. Toda Rabbah, thank you. Thanks, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Toda Rabbah.